Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we sort through the flotsam and jetsam of the last week in the Vatican beat and try to lift up those few nuggets that you really need to know. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with a surprise on the sacraments. The Vatican's watchdog unit for the faith strikes a remarkably hard line position on the question of the validity of sacraments where the proper verbal formula were not employed, that is, when somebody didn't use the right words. We'll explain what they said and why it is a bit of a surprise. Second, we've got mending fences. Pope Francis issues an unexpected and previously unannounced letter to the Jews of Israel, this in the context of what had been great disappointment among many Jewish leaders with regard to the Vatican and the Pope's line on the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas on the Gaza Strip. We'll unpack what the Pope said and take a stab at trying to figure out whether it will be enough to get relations between Catholics and Jews back on track. Third up, we have presenting a new papabile, how the furor over the Vatican's uber-controversial, hyper-controversial document on the blessing of same-sex unions has, in effect, created a stage upon which one African prelate above all has emerged as a compelling new papal candidate. We'll explain who he is and why he is getting a serious look these days. Fourth, we've got the vexing matter of vulnerability. This week, the Vatican issued a quote-unquote clarification on who is responsible for handling cases of sexual abuse against vulnerable adults. We'll unpack why, according to critics, this document did just about everything other than actually clarify the situation. And then finally, this week, we've got a potentially bogus bombshell, how the brother of the Vatican girl, that is, 15-year-old Emanuela Orlandi, whose 1983 disappearance has become the premier Vatican mystery story of modern times, has unearthed a new letter, which he purports to be from a senior Vatican official a decade after his sister's disappearance, confirming that she was in London, and even helping arrange an abortion for her, supposedly. We'll explain why many experts, frankly, have their doubts as to whether this letter is the real deal. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, for the love of God, in the name of all that is holy, invoking the angels and saints, don't go anywhere. You need to know this stuff. We will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial, because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are, they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. 
magisterium.com. That is magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. All right, hello everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, February 6, 2024. As we teased at the top of the program, we begin this week with a surprise on the sacraments. So, this past Saturday, the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, the department once known as the Holy Office, also known in Italian as La Suprema, because it rules over doctrine, the supreme subject in Catholic life, put out a new statement regarding the validity of sacraments, or rather, I should say, the invalidity of sacraments, above all, baptism, when the proper verbal formula are not employed. That is, when people don't use, the ministers of the sacraments, don't use the words as prescribed in the official church documents that regulate the administration of the sacraments. Now, this, of course, technically applies to all seven sacraments of the church, but it is a particularly contested issue when it comes to the sacrament of baptism, because quite frankly, in recent years, in various parts of the world, there has been some freelancing going on with regard to exactly how the sacrament of baptism is administered. The proper formula, for instance, has the minister saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In some parts of the world, people have for a while been saying, we baptize you instead, trying to emphasize the communal nature of the sacrament. I suppose the idea being that the I maybe comes off as a little bit clericalist, the we comes off as a little bit more inclusive, I suppose. Now, in 2020, the then Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith had put out a document saying, no, uh -uh, can't do that, and that any baptism using such a formula would be invalid. And now, three years later, the successor, the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, has essentially doubled down on that position and put out what amounts to a kind of theological primer as to why sacraments celebrated outside the proper formula are invalid, basically saying the church is not the creator of sacraments, it is the custodian, and that these formula have been handed down by tradition according to divine mandate, and it's not up to individual ministers to tinker around with them. Now, here's why this is a bit of a surprising position. Let's take a parallel case, Fiducia Supplicans, the document on the blessing of same-sex unions. That was which just came out on December 18th. That was a clear reversal of a previous document from the same department, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 2021, which said the church cannot bless same-sex unions. Two years later, here we were saying, well, actually we can, at least under some circumstances, if they're non-liturgical and so on. And so it would be utterly reasonable to expect the Vatican this particular department of the Vatican might do a similar kind of flip-flop when it came to the question of the validity of sacraments. Again, a document had come out in 2020 saying, no, you can't do it. I think if you had had betting lines set, and by the way, nobody actually knew this was going to be coming, but if you had had betting lines in advance, I suspect many people would have bet that a similar kind of reversal in favor of a more flexible, more quote-unquote pastoral position might have been coming this time. Instead, that's not what we got. And let's note that this is not just a hypothetical debate, because there are two emblematic cases in the United States. One, in 2020, a priest in Detroit realized that when he had been baptized, the deacon who had performed the baptism had said, we baptize, rather than I baptized. He knew this because his baptism had been videotaped by his parents. He came forward, which essentially meant that not only was his baptism invalid, therefore so was his ordination to the priesthood, therefore so was every sacrament he had celebrated in the years since he was ordained in 2017. He had to be reordained, the people he baptized had to be rebaptized. In 2022, it was revealed that a priest in Phoenix had been using this We Baptize You formula for 26 years. Thousands of baptisms he had performed were therefore in one fell swoop deemed invalid. All of those people 
were invited to undergo the sacrament again. So this is not just angels on a pen stuff. This reaches down and affects real lives. You know, so how do we explain the fact that the same department that took a progressive reversal on same-sex unions took a more conservative reiteration of the hardline stance on the sacraments? Well, I don't know exactly how to explain the difference, but I will say if there is one thing that Pope Francis, a bit like Lady Violet Grantham in Downton Abbey, hates, it is being perceived as predictable. This is not exactly what one would have predicted, and in that sense, it is in keeping in many ways with the spirit of Francis's papacy over more than a decade, just when you think you have things figured out, this Vatican and this Pope is going to throw you a curveball. All right, second up this week, we have mending fences. So also on Saturday, actually just a couple of hours after this document on the sacraments appeared, the Vatican also released the text of a brief but important letter addressed to the Jews of Israel from Pope Francis. In this letter, Pope Francis said that he has noted with great sorrow and great consternation that since the beginning of the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza on October 7th, that around the world there has been a worrying rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism, which in this letter the Pope defines as a sin against God. He says the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is unequivocally committed to resisting anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. He said, we had hoped that the cry of never again, which of course is a reference to the Holocaust, that the cry of never again would be handed down from one generation to the next. Instead, he said, recent events have confirmed that we, that is we Catholics and you Jews, must work together in ever closer collaboration in order to combat these phenomenon, that is, anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Now, the context here is very important. This letter comes out at a time in which there had been increasing signs of discontent in the Jewish community around the world, and perhaps especially in Israel, with the line that this pope and his Vatican team have been taking on the war between Israel and Hamas. I suppose you could articulate those concerns in three points. One, there has been a criticism that the Pope and senior Vatican officials have not specifically condemned Hamas for the sneak attack on October 7th that triggered this conflict, have not publicly labeled Hamas as a terrorist organization and as the aggressor in this conflict. And instead, in the eyes of some critics, the Pope and the Vatican have engaged in a kind of moral equivalence, sort of condemning or lambasting the violence on all sides without acknowledging clearly that Hamas started it. Second source of criticism would be that the Pope has not done or said enough with regard to the liberation of the Israeli hostages who have been taken by Hamas. He, of course, has called for the release of the hostages. But there is some sense among some in the Jewish community that he ought to be doing more, spending more of his moral authority to try to make that happen. Instead, the complaint is that he is engaging in this kind of balancing act, which is unhelpful. And third, there was specific ire in some Jewish circles in November, when on the same day that the Pope received a delegation of family members of those Israeli hostages, he also received a delegation of Palestinians from Gaza. And according to the Palestinians who were in that meeting, he described Israelis ongoing, Israel's ongoing offensive in Gaza as a quote-unquote genocide. Now, a Vatican spokesman issued what I think could best be described as a kind of, oh, I don't know, weak denial of that claim. But the Palestinians insisted that is actually what the Pope said. And that, of course, caused great umbrage in Israeli and Jewish circles. And so for all of these reasons, many Jews have been unhappy. Recently, and we talked about this last week on this program, recently the chief rabbi of Rome, for instance, Ricardo Desaini, claimed that there have been many steps backward 
in Catholic-Jewish relations because of what he described as a kind of ambivalent and frustrating response of the Pope and the Vatican to the conflict in Gaza. So the question is, is this letter from the Pope going to crack the nut? That is, will it be sufficient to get relations back on track? Well, on the one hand, I think it is fair to say that Jewish leaders will be deeply gratified to hear this unequivocal condemnation of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. We'll welcome that. On the other hand, the Pope did not address these other points in the controversy. He, the, the word Hamas never appears in this letter. He does not acknowledge that Israel is engaged in self-defense in the conflict in Gaza. He doesn't address the controversy over whether this is or is not a genocide. None of that. So I think it is probably fair to say that while, while many Jewish leaders would say that this letter is substantially better than nothing, it probably is also fair to say that some of the sources of controversy will remain even after this letter has appeared. You know, we will obviously have to see where the relationship goes from here. All right, third up this week, we've got presenting a new papabile. Papabile is the Italian word for a candidate to be pope. Now, let's be clear. A candidate to be pope is not like a candidate to be president of the United States. Nobody announces their candidacy. There are no committees, you know, no scola for pope in 2013. I mean, that kind of thing just doesn't happen, okay? So the people themselves don't announce this. We in the media do, you know, we proclaim you know, who is and is not a papabile. So by the authority vested in me by absolutely no one on the planet, I am using my platform here this week to declare that a new papabile is among us, and that is Cardinal Fridolin Ambongo of Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, who was also the elected president of the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences of Africa and Madagascar, known by the acronym SECOM. Here's why Mbongo has become a sort of new, what, mini-celebrity in Catholic life. We know that since Fiducia Supokines came out, this document on the blessing of same-sex unions, there has been a lot of reaction, positive and negative. But probably the single most distinctive piece of reaction is for the very first time, the bishops of an entire continent, that is Africa, declared that this document is a dead letter on their territory. That is, they declared in one voice that we are not going to apply this document. There will be no blessings of same-sex unions in Africa because it would not be understood by our people. It would seem confusing. It would seem to contradict the church's teaching on the nature of marriage, and it is inconsistent with African traditional family values. Now, Ambongo gets tremendous credit for having organized the African bishops very quickly to take this compact and unified position spanning an entire continent. If you know anything about how difficult it is to get a body of bishops uniformly to agree on anything, I mean, frankly, to get the bishops of an entire continent to agree that today is Tuesday would be difficult. Okay, the fact that they were able to take a unified position on a complicated question of moral theology that's nothing short of remarkable. And if that's all Mbongo had done, he would have gotten a lot of credit, particularly, of course, among conservative critics, Fiducia. But that isn't all that Mbongo did. Because, you know, he could have sat in his office in Kinshasa, put this statement together, hit the send button, right, and left it at that. But no, Mbongo, who is a, a member of Pope Francis's Council of Cardinal Advisors, appointed to take the spot of his mentor, the late Cardinal Laurent Monsuengo of Kinshasa in Congo in 2020, and then confirmed in that post in 2023. And Bunko, when this statement was being prepared, he got on a plane and he flew to Rome. And before it came out, he went in and saw the Pope and said, Holy Father, look, our bishops are really upset about this. We need to say something. You know, I want to have your blessing. And the Pope said, I understand Go work with Cardinal Victor Emmanuel Fernandez, who is the head of the Dicastery for the Faith. Work this out with him. Ambanco did. He and Fernandez got in front of a computer. They were actually like, like, you know, high school journalism students in the workroom late at night, you know, pounding this out in front of a keyboard. 
and they kept the Pope informed. So when this statement came out, even though it was a big, in a way, a big no to the Vatican, nevertheless, it came with the informal seal of approval, both from the Pope and his top doctrinal advisor, which means that friends and allies of Pope Francis also admire Mbongo for the dialogical and communal way in which he worked this out. In other words, he had his cake and he ate it too. He charmed conservatives by effectively rejecting Fiducia, but he won over liberals and supporters of the Pope by the very deferential way he went about it and the respectful way he went about it. That, ladies and gentlemen, when you can make both sides happy in a deeply polarized time, that is a recipe for winning friends and influencing people. And that, in short fashion, is why Cardinal Embogo is our new Papabile of the Week. Let me note, I do have a little bit of self-interest here. Cardinal Ambongo is a member of the Capuchins. And if you know me, you know I was raised by the Capuchin Franciscans. They are my boys. And so I'm channeling a little bit of Capuchin pride right now. But even aside from that, I would argue that Ambongo deserves a look. All right, fourth up this week, we have the vexing matter of vulnerability. So this week, the Dicastery of the Faith also put out a document on the question of who is responsible for handling cases of the sexual abuse of a quote-unquote vulnerable adult? Now that in turn, of course, raises the question of what do we mean by a vulnerable adult? In the wake of the sexual abuse scandals, when they first blew up in 2001-2002, the Catholic Church, beginning in the United States and radiating out to other parts of the world, created tough new legislation when it came to the sexual abuse of minors, that is, somebody under the age of 18. But over time, it became clear that had left unresolved the question of, okay, but what about abuse against adults who were, in a sense, powerless to resist that abuse, or at least their ability to resist it had been compromised, perhaps because they had some kind of disability, perhaps because they were in a relationship where the abuser had power over them. For instance, a nun who was being abused by a powerful priest or a bishop or something like that. In 2019, when the Pope made his document Vos Estis Permanent, Permanent Law for the Church, it included a kind of expansive definition of a vulnerable adult, meaning not only somebody who had some kind of mental defect, but somebody who was in a relationship in which there was a power differential whose liberty had been compromised for some reason. Now that definition, well, I mean, to call it a definition, frankly, is fairly generous because it, it seems so expansive that it's hard to know kind of what wouldn't count as a vulnerable adult. It has been debated by experts. This week, the Dicastery for the Faith essentially said, look, our responsibility is only for cases of minors and adults who are vulnerable for reason of mental defect. That is, there's a developmental disability, that their mental capacity has been compromised. Other cases in which adults are vulnerable, that's somebody else's problem. And specifically, they ticked off five different Vatican departments, the same departments listed in Vos Estes. You know, so like the Congregation for Eastern Churches, or the Dicastery for Bishops, or the Dicastery for Clergy, or the Dicastery for Religious, all of whom theoretically could be responsible for these cases of vulnerable adults. Now, what critics will tell you about this document is sort of two things. One, it still doesn't solve the problem of what exactly is a vulnerable adult, because again, this definition that we've got now is so broad that it's hard to know what wouldn't fall under its penumbra. And in fact, some critics have raised the question of whether such a broad standard isn't even a little insulting. I mean, do you want to say a woman is a vulnerable adult simply on the basis of being a woman? Is a nun a vulnerable adult simply on the basis of being a nun? You could argue, under the standard we have now, both of those things are true. Some critics, including some of the leading reformers on sex abuse, wonder about whether that's a workable standard. This document does nothing to clarify that debate. And secondly, by saying there are so many departments of the Vatican that could theoretically be responsible, critics say that this has created a situation in which the buck could be passed almost infinitely, right? Somebody comes forward claiming to have been abused as a vulnerable adult. 
brings this to department X. Well, department X could say, nope, not us, you have to go to Y. Y could say, nope, not us, you have to go to Z, and round and round we go, and it's not really clear in the end where the buck actually stops. Obviously, we're gonna have to see how this plays out, but I think it is fair to say this is a clarification that many people would say has not really provided a great deal of additional clarity. Finally, this week, a potentially bogus bombshell. So we have talked before on this show about the ongoing mystery story, what the Italians call un giallo, surrounding the case of Emanuela Orlandi, a 15-year-old girl whose father worked in the prefecture for the papal household, whose family lived in an apartment on Vatican grounds, actually right next to the Swiss Guard barracks, and who disappeared in 1983. We've had no news of her since. And her disappearance over the last 40 years has become a magnet for conspiracy theories of all sorts. Now, her brother, older brother, Pietro Orlandi, has become her champion. He's dedicated his life to the press to, for finding out what happened to his sister. And over the course of the years, he has sometimes presented an alleged new evidence, alleged new leads for investigators, which sometimes under examination seem to be more sizzle than steak. In any event, this week, this past Sunday, Orlandi went on a primetime evening Italian talk show called Verissimo, meaning very, very true, to present what he purported to be a previously unknown letter from a senior cardinal, Cardinal Ugo Poletti, in 1993, so a decade after his sister disappeared, to an official of the British government, which appeared to suggest that Emanuela Orlandi was alive at that time, that is 1993, living in London and pregnant, and Poletti was trying to arrange the help of this British official in providing an abortion for Orlandi. That was the gist of this alleged letter. Now, Orlandi said on the TV show that he had acquired it and think about this provenance. He had acquired it a year ago from a former member of an Italian terrorist organization during the 1970s and 80s known as the Armed Revolutionary Nuclei, and that this purported ex-terrorist had told him. And now how he got this letter was totally unclear, but this guy had apparently told Orlandi that his sister had been taken as part of a pedophile ring for which this terrorist organization was the quote-unquote operational arm, and that this letter was somehow evidence of that. Now, problems with this letter? Well, first of all, it was written in 1993. Poletti resigned as the vicar of Rome in 1991. He was unemployed by 1993, so why he would have been writing this letter is completely mysterious. Second, it was a letter to an official of a former government. The Vicar of Rome does not interact with officials of foreign governments. That's the job of the Vatican Secretary of State. So it's curious as to why the Vicar would have been signing this letter. Third, the official of the foreign government to whom it's addressed, a guy by the name of Frank Cooper, who was once an undersecretary of state in the government in UK and also permanent undersecretary of defense, was also retired by 1993. He had actually retired in 1982. And notably, both Poletti and Cooper are now dead, so neither one of them could possibly confirm whether this letter is authentic. I would note, by the way, this is not the first time that it was suggested that Emanuela Orlandi had ended up in London. In 2017, an Italian journalist published an alleged five-page secret internal memo from the Vatican documenting roughly $300,000 in expenses the Vatican had supposedly occurred, incurred to keep, you know, Orlandi going in London between 1983 and 1997. Now, in that case, the document was on plain white paper, no Vatican letterhead, no protocol number. It used incorrect ecclesiastical titles, and the name of one of the Vatican officials to whom it was allegedly addressed was misspelled. You know, creating real doubt as to whether this was authentic. 
I would suspect similar doubts about authenticity are going to surround this new bombshell letter. The real question here is not so much, are these letters real? The Vatican in 2017 said it was false and ridiculous. They'll probably say something similar now, and most experts probably will buy that. The question is, assuming they're fake, why are people generating these fakes? And I suspect, folks, the sad truth is, because like the Kennedy assassination in the States, like mystery stories everywhere, this stuff sells. And whenever there is a market, there will be unscrupulous operators looking to exploit it, however much doing so may compound the suffering of the Orlandi family and others concerned with her fate. All right, that is our show for this week. You'll find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is www.cruxnow.com. We will see you again here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again very soon.